glad to be here. So glad that you are um, sovereign and over all of the madness, Lord. And we just thank you, Father, for this place, for this time, and this point in history. We thank you, Father, for um, just being God. And I'm so glad you are. So glad that you are over and in charge and in control. So glad, Father, for all the things that you're working out for our good, for your glory, that, that Romans 8, 28, Lord, you're just working all things out uh, to the good of those who are the called uh, according to your purposes, Lord. We thank you, Father. We praise you. We know, God, that... Um, we can be cast down, but uh, we're just not uh, destroyed, Lord. We're, we're, we're persecuted, and uh, we may be in distress, and we may be uh, in trouble. You may feel like, uh, you know, you just, you know, we, Lord, uh, are in trouble up to our necks. But, Lord, you are forever with us. And you tell us, Lord, not to be discouraged, not to be dismayed, not to be afraid. And I pray, O oh God, that you would um, reconcile us to you this day. Help us, Father, to rest in you and to love you and to rest in you this day and to crawl up in your lap. I pray, Father, that you would continue to take care of uh, those that are elderly in our community, in our church, Lord, that you protect them from COVID. We pray, O oh God, for um, those who have lost family members to COVID, to COVID um, Mary Sue Gaddy, Father, I lift her up. Uh, I lift up Mr. Brian to you, Lord. Uh, thank you for touching his heart and, and healing it. Uh, we lift up, Father, um, our families, Gail's sister, Lord, that you continue to work in her life, Miss Barbara. Uh, I pray, Lord, for uh, rest for those uh, who uh, are weary. I pray, Father, that you would, again, just be with us and comfort us, Lord. Lead and guide this message this time. I thank you for bringing Gray home. I pray for Carmen. We pray for Noah and Emily, oh God. We, we pray, oh God, that you would just touch every member of our congregation, wherever they may be, and that you would show up to them today and manifest yourself to them, Lord, in a special way and love them this day, love their pains and sorrows and hurts. And uh, I pray that you would be their joy. In Jesus' name. Um, turn with me to Matthew uh, 11, and this is a, a, a fabulous lesson. It really has spoken to my heart in a lot of different ways. And uh, before I read that, I want to read uh, Malachi to you. Malachi 3 talks about John the Baptist, and this whole lesson is actually about Jesus and John the Baptist. So you've got, you know, two men here. One is the Messiah, and the other is the one that, is letting everybody know he's the forerunner. He's the one that was chosen by God to say, this is my son. And, and think about it. John went through a, a very cool experience being able to preach repentance and telling people that the Messiah is coming. you got to get ready. And uh, he got to baptize him. He got to see, you know, the dove ascending on him. And, 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 and everything that entailed that whole experience had to be amazing that he got to see that and be a part of it. So he had all of that excitement and all of that uh, experience, so to speak, of, of being able to preach to people. And people came out to hear this guy. And you think about him when you describe him, um, you know, he wore the... Uh, furry, fuzzy uh, clothes. <laughs> he ate honey and locusts, and uh, he was a Nazarite, so he was forbidden uh, from any kind of, you know, because people in that day drank wine, he was forbidden from any of that. He was um, a special set-apart guy, right? Um, so I want to read the, the uh, scripture in Malachi 3. In verse 1 it says, Behold, this was the prophecy about John. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And he will prepare the way before me. He will prepare the way before me. This is what John's whole call on his life was. Um, 
you know, he had a special birth. There was, you know, so much about him. Of course, Christ's birth with, you know, the Virgin Mary, everything that surrounded these two men. He will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then it goes on and talks about um, being purified and actually talks about Christ's second coming, which is going to be fulfilled in Revelation 11.3 when Elijah, the actual Elijah, is going to be one of those two messengers. Okay, We don't know who the other one is, but we're very sure that one is Elijah and there's conjecture on who the other is. We won't go there. That doesn't fit with the lesson today. But then when people were looking at John, he came in the spirit of Elijah. Okay? So he fought, so that you know, so many of God's uh, scripture have a partial fulfillment and then a fuller fulfillment later, which makes his scripture so beautiful. And so we've already had that. Now turn with me then to Matthew 11. Hello. <laughs> that was cool. Matthew 11. Felt like I should bow after that. It says, uh, and I'd like to, I know we're supposed to start, you know, uh, later in verse 7, but let's, we've got to do the first of it. And to get the whole setting of everything, if you look in Matthew 10, Jesus has told the disciples, you know, to go out, and he's told them how to go out and what to do and how to, you know, what to take with them and how to minister to try to tell people about the, the Messiah. So that's what Matthew 10 is about, and it's interesting um, all the things that you know Jesus tells him to do in Matthew 10, and he sends the 12 out and, and all of that, commissions them, and then John the Baptist sends a messenger and asks a question. And so let's read uh, the first couple of verses here, okay? Let's read one through three. It came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. So he had commanded the 12 disciples you know, to go out, and so he himself departs to teach and preach. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, I'm sorry, I'm just moving that down a little bit. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. And I'll stop there. So um, where's John? Why is he in prison? He's preaching, he's in prison, he's preaching, they want to cut his head off. What was he preaching besides, you know, repentance? Mm -hmm. What had he said that landed him in prison? Herod. Ah. Herod had taken on his brother's wife. Ooh. So Herod had visited his brother, you know, family reunion. Nothing unusual about that. But while he was there, he um, thought that uh, his brother's wife was a good-looking chick and had seduced her. And not only seduced her, but when he left, he took her with him. <laughs> Oops. Not good. So John, with the ministry that God had put on him to preach repentance had been preaching repentance from the top down and told Herod Antipas, you know, you're with your, you've got your brother's wife, so um, you need to repent. And uh, Herod responded not so well. Did Herod repent? No. <laughs> Herod uh, arrested John and put him in prison. So here's John, got all these questions and all this, th you know, things going on. So... Gal. Mm -hmm. Salome, absolutely. Whenever he asked her to dance for him, I'll give you anything in my kingdom. Ah, oh, you want diamonds, you want rubies, you want riches. Her response kind of shocked him. <laughs> That's the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So here's John with you know, just foreboding doom, you know, all over his life. 
and he's starting to ask some questions. Um, how do you know that sometimes being in prison or being in a prison, not of your own making, because he was doing what God had told him to do. So you could, you know, it was of his own making, but he was doing what God had told him to do. And here he was in prison, and whenever you're in the, a situation where you don't have any understanding, you can get confused. God, what are you doing? I'm doing what you told me to do. Taking care of what you told me to take care of. And fulfilling, you know, the call that you've put on my life. And John's wondering, because, you know, the, when the time gets long and drawn out, John's wondering, why haven't you shown up, Lord? You've called me and commissioned me. Why? And I did what you told me to do. Why am I in here? So uh, he didn't ask his, the, the question, you know, it was for his own sake, but it was also for the sake of his disciples because he's got these men that are following him and he's concerned about their welfare too. That's his family. He loves these guys. So he, you know, wants to also make sure that they're going to be taken care of because I think he's got pretty much a good idea of what his future is looking like. I think he's you know, probably feeling that out pretty good. Go ahead, Mr. Robert. Are you who you say you are? Right. Are you who you say you are? Um, the, the problem here is, you know, are you the coming one or do we look for another? We need to know. So, you know, the possibility of, you know, those false messiahs, because there's always those. I mean, it's always been that. And people, you know, um, th this indicates that John had recognized Jesus as the messiah, his present doubt may be explained because perhaps he himself had misunderstood the ministry of the Messiah. What did people in that day, because of what they had access to, what were they told, or who were they told that the Messiah would be? He'll come to earth and he'll bring peace and righteousness. It's in Isaiah. He'll come to earth, he will be... Um, uh, the, the leader, he'll restore Israel to her, you know, uh, yeah, to what she used to be, but also restoring the earth to who the earth was supposed to be, and there would be peace and righteousness. Um, think about the, the, the prophecies that are in Isaiah where, you know, there would be peace on, even between the animals. I mean, just all of this. If we go back to Isaiah, and I'm going to flip back and read just 64. All these things were going through um, John's head. Of course, he had time to think about it, right? Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down, the mountain shook at your presence. And it goes on, Isaiah 65, uh, in the last part. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Um, and uh, for behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall be no longer uh, shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And it goes on and talks about where infants will live into a hundred. See, this is what they're looking for. They're, they're, and then uh, uh, Isaiah 66, where uh, the Lord will vindicate Zion, and, and all of these things are going to happen um, in, in these last couple of verses. This is what these people have been told and what they're looking for um, and and it, it, like I said, it goes on and you can read all the things that they're 
thinking about and that they're looking for, okay? So John wants to know, are you the Messiah? Are you the one that's going to perform all of these works? But see, that's connected with a political redeemer, a political, you know, they're looking for the one who's going to overthrow Rome. Well, thus far, tell me what Jesus has been doing as far as overthrowing Rome. I mean, from the perspective of the people who were living there, nothing. He's been going around healing, teaching, restoring sight to the blind, um, healing the lame, healing leprosy, raising the dead. We covered all of it. He's been doing the works of God. Not this political overthrow that the people are, you know, thinking about. So you've got to think about what uh, is going through John's head. Maybe, you know, we've, we're mistaken. Maybe we've got it wrong, and uh, <laughs> there, there might be some confusion on John's part. That idea is floating out there. Yeah. Plus, I tell you, whenever things aren't going the way you expect them, think about the unbelief that can come into your own life. Yeah. I can attest to that one. You start wondering, doubting. And you know, you know that you know the answers, right? You know what's the truth. Like uh, that song, that, that's, it's an old song, the voice of truth keeps telling me a different story. I know what I know, but then everything over here for John was looking really bad. So he, you know, was, uh, but look what his answer is. Go and tell John the things that you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf, we left the deaf out, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now he makes this comment, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. A lot of people have pulled away from our Lord because he hasn't worked out their circumstances the way they wanted them to be worked out. They have. Folks have done that. Life hadn't worked out to their expectations. Not realizing. Anybody been there? <laughs> And so, blessed is he who's not offended because of me. Because if you'll try, okay, I mean, there's so much in this lesson. Oh, my gracious. So, Jesus told him to go and tell John the things that you hear and you see. Go and tell him what I'm doing, what, what's been going on. So, Jesus wanted to assure John and the disciples who came to see him that he is the Messiah. But he also wanted them to understand that he did what he did, his acts of service, the things that God had, had called Jesus to do, were displayed in, in humble acts of service. Jesus was meeting individual needs. He was not doing these spectacular displays of um, uh, making uh, something you know, happen like actually moving a whole mountain <laughs> or, you know, crumbling something that was in his way. He was meeting your need. He was meeting your need. He was meeting your need. He still does it today. Blessed is he who's not offended because of me. That's huge. <laughs> huge. Because it still is the same thing today. We go, are you really going to be Lord in my life? Are you really? And the whole time he's meeting our individual needs. He's doing for you what you need right now at this point. Not these spectacular fireworks. Hey, he could make the fireworks display be amazing <laughs> if he wanted to. But not this political deliverance. And SJ was preaching on that Wednesday night. Um, another great uh, message. Y'all, please come on Wednesday nights if you can. Um, about the flag and, you know, that that, that flag's not going to be in heaven. <laughs> you 
as much as we love America, but we're fighting over something that's not even going to be in heaven. Right? We're fighting over the wrong stuff. Um, But anyway, we might, you know, phrase John's question like this. Jesus, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing more? Why haven't you come and released us from the bondage of Rome? Because Rome had, you know, that whole area, well, Rome had a lot of areas under their conquest. And uh, to the restless impatience, he utters the same warning. For the most part, the way of the Lord's service is the way of daily perseverance in meeting the individual needs of those that God has given to you, the people in your pathways, the people that he puts along your uh, everyday existence. And the history of the church shows that this is a difficult lesson to learn of just meeting individual needs on a daily basis and reaching out and just being Jesus to the people that need Jesus that day. You know what I'm saying? And we're, we're expecting these big, amazing, you know, miracles. And not that he can't do that. I mean, I've seen God give the guy a, a brand new heart. I've seen God heal people in so many amazing ways. Just the things that he does. And then, you know, blessed is he who's not offended because of me. And Jesus knew that the focus of his ministry was offensive because their expectations were different than what he had actually been sent to do. So, you know, I'm I'm, I'm adopting a a statement, and I've I've said it before, I have no expectations. You know, I have no expectations. I have hope. I have hope. But sometimes you've got to change your expectations um, and be uh, content in such things as you have rather than, um, of course, you know, there's, of course, nothing wrong with hope. These people expected political deliverance from the Roman domination, and there's a blessing for those who are not offended because the Messiah um, that came, and he wasn't the expectation of the people. Wow. So um, it's called The Blessedness of the Unoffended, F.B. Meyer, great biblical commentator. The Blessedness of the Unoffended. And here's what he says. Blessed is he who can be left in prison, Blessed is he who can be silenced in his testimony. Blessed is he who can seem to be deserted of his Lord and yet shut out every doubt. Blessed is the unoffended. So uh, John, he gained this unoffendedness. Isn't that amazing? That even there while he was in prison, the guy's getting ready to have his head cut off. When all he did was tell the truth. You ever been come against because you told the truth? Sure. Sure you have. So then the neat thing that Jesus does is he answers the disciples' question and then they're going to leave and go tell him, but Jesus starts talking about John and I'll bet you they stop and turn around and listen to that part. I mean, I can't prove that. I'm just speculating. But look what Jesus starts doing talking about John. And it says, As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Was that who John was? Was John a reed blowing back and forth? No. That was a tough dude. I bet you if you got in a fight with John, he could take you. He could show you something. (laughs) He was a lean man. I mean, he ain't locust and honey. You know what I'm saying? He didn't have all this extra that I'm carrying around. You know what I'm saying? French fries and cheeseburgers. Yeah, that's my favorite. So, you, you, a reed unaffected by the wind? No, that's not who you saw. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments like a king, pampered and pretty with all the pomp? No. You saw a tough dude who lived out in the desert, and he could catch scorpions and, you know, no big deal to him. A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus is uh, quoting Malachi, which we started out with you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. I want to talk about what that means. And it says, But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven 
is greater than he. We want to talk about what Jesus meant. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. We want to talk about that. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So John is your last Old Testament prophet. Think about it. He's your, you know, I know there was 400 years from the time Malachi had written what he, writ, what he wrote, and then before John came to prophesy about Jesus, John is, and, he, and John died under the law because Pentecost hadn't happened yet. Let's, let's look at all of that. There's a lot of cool things in here. So Jesus says a prophet. Let me go back to where we were there in verse 7. A prophet, and more than a prophet. Uh, Jesus reminded them that John was God's chosen herald, the forerunner of the Messiah. Was John a man pleaser? No. Was he a self pleaser? See, that's where I feel guilty because I like to please me. I'm not really concerned about pleasing others, you know what I'm saying? But was he a man pleaser? No. Was he a self pleaser? No. He was a he denied himself so much. And that's where I feel guilty. I don't, I don't know that I deny myself a whole lot. I like me pretty good. Which makes me feel guilty. So he was in fact more than a prophet because he alone had the ministry of serving as Jesus' herald. In other words, he introduced him. You know how sometimes if we have a guest speaker, um, then someone will uh, announce them and talk about what all their credentials are and all of that. So for that, because he was the herald, he was uh, the greatest of all prophets, and that's what he said. Among those born of women, there's not risen one greater than John the Baptist because he was chosen to be the herald. Now, again, remember, each one of you, us, we're all chosen to be something in our point in history. Whatever it is, you're chosen. And, and it's like I've told Molly before, you know, with her headaches and all the stuff that she suffers through. I said, you know, there might be one little old girl or one little fella out there that you're going to meet and you're going to be able to minister to them because of this chronic pain and, and headache that you suffer with, and you're going to make that difference in that one person's life. And I said, Molly, it, it's worth it for that one thing. You think about everything you've been through and you've been through, everything y'all, you know, each one of you sitting in here, what you've been through is for somebody else. It is, as we trust the Lord. Or you can be a self-pleaser and go off and do your own thing. Live life the way you want to. You know, King Solomon did for a long time. Figured out what he wanted to do. And you know, when he came to the final result was all is vanity. It's all, you know, been done before. It's all the same stuff. It's that one person you're going to make a difference in their life. Mr. Robert. To one person, you may be the whole world, and you don't realize it. What your purpose is. You'll know. Amen to that. And, and, and Jesus is telling, you know, John, that this is who he is. And, and because he uh, was chosen to be the one to introduce me, so to speak, among those born of women, there's not risen one greater than John. And then he starts talking, you know, this is he of whom it is written. Um, and, and he talks about who he is. But then I want to flip this around. The interesting thing, when Jesus says... Oh, let me find where I am. I'm in the wrong spot. Hold on. Among those born of women, there's not risen one greater than John, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Like, so he flips it. But think about it. Think about who John was. John was steady, wasn't he? You could count on John. 
John was going to be the same guy every time you met him. Don't you love those people that are the same every time you meet them? They just, you can count on that. You just love that. They're always the same. You know, John was steady. He's not easily shaken like a, a reed. John was sober in that he lived a disciplined life. He, he lived in, you know, the, the, uh, eating the, the locust and honey and wearing shaggy clothes. He, he, he had a self-disciplined life. He was not in love with the luxuries and comforts of this world. He lived out in the wilderness. That's just who John was. And John was a servant. He was a prophet of God. And not only that, but because he was a servant and a prophet of God, he knew he was sent. And he knew that his message meant something. He knew that he had this burning desire to preach repentance. He, it was in his bones. He couldn't help it. So whenever you know, Herod was with his you know, sister-in-law, it's just natural for a servant of the Lord, a prophet, to say, hey, you're sleeping with your sister-in-law. Not cool. Can't do it. It's wrong. Um, and so he was special because uh, of being that messenger of the Lord, but he was also special because he was considered the greatest under the old covenant. Look what it says. There's nobody greater than John the Baptist. He lived under the law. Jesus came. John gets killed before Pentecost happens. So you think about, you know, what, th this messenger that he was that he never realized Holy Spirit on him and, and all over him, but not in him. That's amazing to me. What a special guy he was. And, that, and Jesus says this, he was second to even the least in the kingdom under the new covenant. So he was second to all of us because we understand grace, Holy Spirit living inside of us. So that's what Jesus was doing. He was comparing the old covenant to the new covenant and the message that Jesus had for those disciples was not just for the disciples that came to see him. It's for us as disciples today. That, that John the, Does that not tell you how special you are to God? That, that John the Baptist was least to, second to you. And look what his calling was. Well, that ought to make you feel chosen. Not for, oh, what's that I am who you say I am? Um, that Hillsong... Um, a worship song. Boy, I'm loving that one. Enjoying that whenever that comes on. So it's amazing that this is uh, who we are. He was not born under the. He was not born again under the new covenant because he lived and died before Jesus' work at the cross and the empty tomb and Pentecost and the whole thing. So we think about how awesome that is, and uh, that the least in the gospel. This is what uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said. The least in the gospel stands on higher ground than the greatest one, John the Baptist, who lived under the law. Wow. The least in the gospel stands on higher ground than the one born under the law. Wow. Aren't you glad you live in the age of grace? Aren't you glad that God picked this time of history out just for you to live in? What's well, crazy out there? Sure it is. It is crazy out there. This COVID stuff, all the, you know, uh, unrest and, and, and just crazy stuff. Um, the crowd that was up in Seattle, Washington, that got moved out of that special zone they were trying to be in, <laughs> where there's no police protection. I mean, there's some crazy stuff going on out there. So it is. Well, let's go ahead and go on to the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I know y'all read that before. Have you ever really understood what it means? Let's read that again. It's in um, verse uh, 12 of Matthew 11. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. What a neat statement. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Is it spiritual warfare? Is it physical? The days are coming where uh, people, uh, and that's, this is us, and this, this coming generation, you think about Brittany's kids and what they're going to have to face. That's got to be a special generation. I think about Solomon and Elijah, little Jonah. I think about all these children that are getting ready to be born, have to have this special anointing 
if they're going to be servants and messengers in the kingdom of God. It's fixing to get violent. You know, civil liberties are being attacked left and right. And I hate to tell you, but you know the church is probably, you said this, Pastor, next on the list. Persecution is coming. Some of us are like, glad I'm 80. (laughs) Wow. I think about them too. But God's raising up a rough, tough generation of kids who've already gone through a lot of heartache and pain before they've even gotten older. Right? Struggling and, and, and special situations and preparation for this coming generation of the kids who are going to share the gospel. <clears throat> That's going to be a rough, tough bunch. It does. They've got to be tough. They've got to be John the Baptist tough. Right? To speak out against all the atrocities that are, that are fixing to come our way. But uh, the violence can refer, and this is a commentator's idea, okay? The violence can refer to both the intensity of spiritual warfare that surrounded the ministry of Jesus. Now you think about what was coming against Jesus all the time. Hey, coming against you too. Coming against us. The intensity of spiritual warfare, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And also to the intensity required to persevere in following God and his kingdom. Meaning the violent take it by force. That uh, people that are living and breathing in the kingdom of God, not that you're going to be violent, but you've got to be unshakable. You've got to be a fighter. You've got to be tough to come up against the intensity of what's happening in our day now. You know what? The old devil just cannot stand it. You know, and, and this is my take. Can I just give you my take? This is my take. I think I told the pastor this. He just walked in. You know, from the time God called us to establish a church for all people, you know, you know, we got kicked out of a couple of churches because of, you know, wanting blacks and whites to worship together. You know, and I, and I, would, I told my school kids, you know, it seemed like in the 2000s, 2010s, it seemed to me that people racially were coming together more than ever. We saw uh, people of different races marrying each other, falling in love, did not care, you know, about this, cared about the heart and the content of the person inside. And we've seen, you know, so many people just marrying and, 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 and races coming together. And I don't think the devil could stand it. I think the devil's just fighting mad that people were actually coming together and loving each other and leaving all of that mess alone behind them. And he couldn't stand it. He had to bring something in and stop it and make it crazy again. And I just want to tell you, you know, don't let it happen in our lives. Don't don't get discouraged. I hate the old nasty, slimy, filthy thing always coming against God's people trying to to divide people. That's what he does. Can't stand him. Well, here we go. So this that whole um, verse right there has been hotly debated. And, um, you know, it's just time for courageous souls, forceful souls, people that don't mind getting knocked down and then getting picked up seven times again, like the proverb says the righteous will do. Forceful people who can take hold of the kingdom of God and spread it and spread the gospel and not worry.